Welcome this morning to Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you're a visitor with us, we welcome you to join us as we worship our Creator God. We're going to worship Him by studying His Word, by singing songs of praise and worship, by remembering the Lord Jesus in the breaking of bread. We'll give financially and we'll fellowship with each other. And all these are expressions of worship. And if you're a visitor, we welcome you to join us. How many people here were taught in school that mankind appeared on this planet as a result of evolution, that man evolved from ape-like ancestors in the Pleistocene epoch of the Cenozoic era and appeared on Earth about a million years ago? How many of you were taught, like this sign at the Albuquerque Zoo says, You are an ape. It says that you're one of the great apes, that you have 99% of your DNA that's like chimpanzees, which is a twisted, not accurate statement. But these scientific facts are just presented. How many of you were taught those things? Me too. That's what I was taught in school. But at home, I was taught that God made man, and ultimately me, for a purpose. And I've carried these two ideas with me all my life. And the tension between them has always existed with me as far back as I can remember Theologically, I knew that it was true that God made mankind, but scientifically, it was necessary for me as an engineer and a scientist and a person who made my living testing things, it was necessary for me to somehow accommodate the evolutionary development of man and the long geological ages required by that model. And and throughout my life, I have been somewhat intimidated by evolutionists, not to disbelieve creationism, but to be silent about it. Because it is not, supposedly, it's not scientific. Now, I don't have the time or the knowledge, actually, at my fingertip this morning to explain the massive statistical impossibility of life evolving by naturalistic random processes. But I do want to quote George Wald, a Harvard professor and author of The Physics and Chemistry of Life regarding the origin of life. He wrote, and I quote, The important point is that since the origin of life belongs in the category of at least once phenomena, time is on its side. However improbable we regard this event, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at some point, at least once. Time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, and the possible probable, and the probable certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. End quote. However, it can be statistically shown that there is, in fact, not enough time available, even in the evolutionist's postulated age of the earth, for time to perform this miracle. But the point I want to make this morning is that the evolutionary development of man is a belief system. It requires miracles. 
it is not a scientifically observed or demonstrated or in any way proven fact. It's not even a legitimate scientific theory because it can't be tested. It is a model. It's a faith-based system with time plus chance as the omnipotent hero. Now, to be fair, the special creation of man by an omnipotent God is also a model. It, too, cannot be tested. It cannot be proven. It, like evolution, must simply be believed or not believed. But I would suggest that the special creation of this universe and this earth and of mankind by an omnipotent designer much better explains the observed creation than does evolution because design and this universe and this solar system and this earth and these human bodies and the animals and the plants, we all have wonderful designs. Design requires a designer. And I have just as much right scientifically to believe in an omnipotent creator God as described in the creation model as does an evolutionist to believe in an omnipotent time plus chance as described in the evolution model. Now, that fact that realization that the creation model explains the scientifically observed facts of this world better than does the evolution model has been completely settled for me in these past two weeks, uh, six weeks, by reading these two books, Scientific Creationism by Henry Morris. I have a copy of it here, and you can look at it and get the information. And The Genesis Flood the biblical record and its scientific implications by John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. And if you have struggled with this intimidation that I've spoken about this morning, I invite you to read these books. I highly recommend that you read these books. They are not easy books to read. You gotta think. but I recommend that you read them. Now, theologically, I've always, um, as I said, since my youth, believed that God created the heavens and the earth and mankind just as he said he did in the Genesis record. And this morning, we will take a look at the first account of the creation of man. Next week, Matt, when he looks at chapter 2, verses five, 4 through 25, uh, will... Uh, explain to us the second account and somewhat more detailed account of the creation of Adam and Eve. Today's passage is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, and it tells us of the creation of man, which was done on the sixth creation day, just after the creation on the same day of all the land animals. The creation of the sea creatures and the fishes and the birds uh, had been done on the previous day, the fifth creation day. So as we come to today's account, we come with the world prepared and populated with animals and plants ready for mankind, the pinnacle of God's creation, who would rule over it. Before I read our passage, I just want to give you the outline that I'm going to follow in verses 26 and 27, we have mankind made in the image of God. Verse 28, mankind is blessed and commissioned. Verses 29 and 30, mankind provisioned. And the completed creation is evaluated in verse 31. Okay? Let's read our passage. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Okay. Mankind made in the image of God, verses 26 and 27. Verse 26 begins, Then God said. Eight times in Genesis chapter 1, the phrase, God said, is recorded. And six times, the sentence or the paragraph beginning with that phrase, God said, ends with the phrase, and it was so. When God speaks his will, it happens. And the result is good. Six times in Genesis chapter 1, the phrase, it was good, is repeated. And one time in verse 31, which we have just read, it concludes it was very good. From these observations, we learn that God's word is powerful. God spoke the universe into existence. And dear ones, God wrote a book. It is the word of God. It too is powerful and it will accomplish its purposes. And think about this. When God became a man, he was called the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as flesh dwelling among us, he gave God's complete and full revelation of himself. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The Hebrew word translated God is Elohim. And as you know, the ending I am is the plural ending in Hebrew. And then notice, too, that the pronouns us and our are used in this sentence, and those are plural pronouns. So to whom is God speaking? Is he talking to the angels? Well, we don't even know that the angels had yet been made. I mean, we're not told when the angels were made. You might be able to imply some things by reading around in Scripture, but that's not the point of Scripture. It doesn't tell us when angels were made. And anyway, angels are creatures. They're not creators. And this discussion is about creating. So he's not talking to angels. No, what we have here is the first recorded conversation among the divine persons of the Godhead. Now, be certain of this. God is one. The Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. There is one God. So yes, there is one God. However, there are three divine persons in all of Scripture who are called God and who exhibit divine characteristics. Therefore, the three divine persons are the one God. This truth is not fully explained or developed here in these verses, but it is the beginning of God's revelation of himself as a triune God. 
And by the way, a quick glance through Scripture gives us at least nine more conversations among the Godhead. And I have those references here. If you want to see those references, come talk to me afterwards and say good things to me, and then I'll give you the... <laughs> I need encouragement just like you. I'll give you those passages. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That humankind is made in God's image is, is mentioned twice more in verse 27. In his own image and in the image of God. As you know, when God repeats himself, it's important. Mankind is uniquely made in God's image after his likeness. Man is uniquely like God among all his creatures. We were made, created, after the deliberate plan and purpose of God. And we are patterned after him. We are not apes. We're not. Okay, what is the image of God? The likeness of God that mankind uniquely bears. What does that mean? I believe that it means that man was placed on the earth as God's... Whoa. I'm sorry. I believe that man was placed on the earth there as God's, sorry, technology representatives. And I believe that mankind resembles God in certain ways. I think that's what the image of God means on a larger scale. It means that mankind is different than all the animals of the land, sea, and sky. We're different. We're other. The image of God contains or entails those aspects of human nature that are not shared with animals. Like God, who is an eternal spirit, man has an eternal spirit and possesses aesthetic and moral and spiritual attributes patterned after God. And here's something to think about. When God appears to man, all throughout Scripture, He appears in human form. There's something about the human body that is uniquely appropriate to God's manifestation of Himself. When God came to be among us in the person of Jesus, He came in the likeness of men, just as we have been made in the likeness of God. Romans 8 says that. In verse 3 it reads, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son. How? in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, note also that God made both male and female in his likeness. This likeness of God that we bear, this image of God, is not gender specific. We all bear it the same. Okay, let's list some of the specific details of the image of God that we bear as human beings. God has a will, emotions, and intellect. Mankind has a will. Uh, ask your youngsters on the way home today if they want to eat liver and spinach for the rest of the week. And they'll, they'll tell you their will. Right? Mankind has a will. Mankind has... Uh, emotions that transcend instinct. And mankind has intellect. Well, I, some of us do. John, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry to point you out again. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Appreciate your help. Next, God has a moral nature. And we as human beings have a moral nature and we have a conscience. 
God has the power to communicate. We as human beings have the power to communicate. God is aesthetic. That is, he can see and appreciate beauty. Mankind is aesthetic. We too can see. Oh, there should be an A on there. I apologize. A-E-S. Don't let that distract you. It distracted me right now. Last night I was watching on YouTube uh, an artist make a picture of a child's face using colored pencils. It brought me to tears. It was so beautiful, so amazingly done, so wonderful. I, I just went, I vocalized. My wife's not here. I'm here by myself this week. She's coming back tonight. Um, but I'm sitting there watching YouTube. <laughs> and I just said, oh, my goodness, out loud. I couldn't say, it was so beautiful. I have the ability to appreciate beauty. You might get that same sensation when you see a sunrise or when you look into your wife's face. Of course. We get that from God. We're made in God's image. God is aesthetic. We too are aesthetic and they have the ability to appreciate beauty. God is a creator. Man is a maker. God is responsive to what he knows and observes. Man, too, is responsive to input, what we see, what we hear, what we observe. We're responsive to that. That's part of the image of God. God is a worker. He worked six days and he rested from the work that he had done. God is a worker. Mankind was made to work. And when we work, we imitate God. In all these ways and more, we bear uniquely the image of God, the likeness of God. I mentioned work last because in the last part of verse 16, God speaks about man's work. And let them, male and female, let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It was God's specific design and plan for mankind to work, specifically here to rule over creation. And I'll say more about work as we get to verse 28. And now before we move on, I'd like to make Note, I'd like you to see and, and take note of the fact that God, four times in these two verses, it says that God made mankind. Four times in two sentences. Do you see it? Verse 26, let us make man. Verse 27, God created man. He created them and he created them. It occurs to me that God wants us to know that he made us. He created us. We did not evolve from in inanimate matter, progress through an evolutionary chain, and have apes as ancestors. No. God made us. Now, why this strong emphasis on this point here? On God's part, why did he have this recorded four times? I think at least part of the answer is in Isaiah 44, 11, where he says, God says, I will not give my glory to another. God is completely unwilling to share the glory displayed in the creation of man. He will not share it with a supposed God of time, plus chance. That brings us to our second outline point. We are making headway. Mankind blessed and commissioned in verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on earth. And God blessed them. 
who are the them? Well, it's male and female. It's Adam and Eve. And we'll see that in more detail next week in chapter 2. This is the second blessing that God gave in the creation week. In verse 22, on the previous day, God had blessed the water creatures and the birds of the air and told them to multiply and fill the earth and fill the waters. Now in verse 28, God tells Adam and Eve the same blessing. And to his blessing, he adds commands. Well, actually, the command, the blessing, contains five instructions, five commands, five imperatives. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and every living creature. God didn't tell the animals to subdue the earth and to rule, but mankind was commanded to subdue the earth and to rule. Now, notice this. Mankind was given work to do before sin entered into the world. Work is, part, is not part of the curse. No, work is part of the blessing. It's true, and we'll see this when we get to chapter 3, that after sin occurred, work became much more difficult and child be bearing became painful because of the curse, but work itself and being fruitful and multiplying childbirth were both part of the blessing, not the curse. God is a worker, so mankind is to work because we, male and female, are God's image bearers. Now, here's an interesting note. Did you notice here that Adam and Eve were created full grown? They were made ready to reproduce. That indicates maturity and age. And if the first man and the first woman were made mature with the appearance of age, it stands to reason that this would be true of everything else that God made. And that's exactly what we see. Water was made as water, not as oxygen and hydrogen waiting to combine and then soon become... No, it was made as water. Rocks were made as rocks. The elements had the appearance of age when they were made. Plants were made as plants, not seeds. The fruit-bearing plants and trees on the third day were created full-grown with the appearance of age. Now, here's one that needs some thinking. Light was made on day one, right? And the purpose, the specifically stated purpose of the light was to shine on the earth. And so it did. The sun and the moon and the stars were not made until day four. So, light was made shining on the earth before the ultimate sources of that light were made. In other words, it didn't take light years for light to shine upon the earth from distant stars. The light was made, then the stars were made. Light was made in place, already shining on the earth. It too was made with the appearance of age. That kind of stuff jazzes me up. I, li I like that stuff. Okay, before we move on, let's think briefly about the work that uh, God gave man to do. Uh, God told man to subdue the earth and to rule over all the animals. So what's entailed in this great task, this great work? Well, these commands clearly indicate man's unique relation to creation. Uh, man is God's representative. God's steward in ruling over the created world and all things in it. 
Man was told by God to subdue it, to conquer it, to tread about on it. But he was never told to abuse it. Never. That abuse that we see apparent in our world today was a result of sin. The modern crises in Earth's environment are due to man's greed and selfishness and carelessness. We have failed to properly obey what God has told us to do as a human race, mankind, with respect to the environment and the delicate ecosystems of this planet. This commission, by the way, has never been retracted. Mankind is still under its obligations. And we, as a whole of humanity, would find ourselves immeasurably more effective and productive in this great task if we would approach it in the reverent and believing attitude of honest and good servants of our Maker, according to our commission. That brings us to verses 29 and 30. Maybe. Where mankind is provisioned. Then God said, Behold. It's like, Behold. I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree that has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. Is it, is it obvious to you, like it is to me, <laughs> that mankind was provisioned with a vegetarian diet? It's true. That's what God said here. Every plant yielding seed and every fruit tree, it shall be food for you. That's a plant-based diet, right? Now, before you get all fired up <laughs> and, and you say to me, see, plant-based diet, that's God's plan. I have a biblical basis for it. So I can try to manipulate you and force you to eat plants only because it's more healthy for you. I'm doing it because I love you. I have someone like that in my life. Um, so before you do that, let me bring you to Genesis chapter 9. After Noah left the ark, it says... And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the terror of you, this is a new thing. The fear of you and the terror of you, it did not, apparently did not exist up until this time, shall be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. And... Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. And there's only one restriction, and that's in verse 4. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. But Adam and Eve, before the fall, had a plant-based diet. If it makes you meat eaters feel any better about Adam and Eve's plant-based diet, look at verse 30. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So they too were vegetarians. Okay, that brings us to uh, verse 31, God's evaluation of his creation. And God saw all that he had made. And behold... It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And God saw all that he had made. Again, it's emphasized that God made it all. He made the universe. He made the solar system. He made our earth with its unique ability to support plant and animal and human life. He made all the plants and the animals to fill it, and he made as a pinnacle of his creative work, he made mankind and assigned us to be Earth's
caretakers. In Psalm 19, David sings about this creation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And in Psalm 24, he sings again, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the rivers and he has, on the seas, and he has established it upon the rivers. Yes, yes, God made it all. And God made us. We saw that in Psalm 139, where David sings again, Thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works. My soul knows it very well. And regarding his original creation, what was God's evaluation? Verse 31 continues, and behold, it was very good. This word, these words could be translated, it was exceedingly good. Creation was at its peak when it was made. And by the way, it's been going downhill ever since, right? It's been disintegrating ever since sin entered into the world. And because of sin, all creation groans. It says that in Romans 8, 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will. And then in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers. In other words, at the beginning, creation was, all of creation was exceedingly good. And as a result of sin, it has declined. Hello? That agrees far better with the second law of thermodynamics, which says that things go downhill, or for you more technical types, it talks about the increase of entropy, the loss of usable energy. This creation model explains that second law of thermodynamics much better than does the evolutionary model, which says things start at a low level and have to progress up the scale. There's just one scientific comparison between the creation model and the evolution model, and the creation model explains it far better. And you will find the same thing true as you read these books that I've recommended about all of the other things that are used, the fossil record, the geological age of the earth, the shape of mountains, the layer of strata, the fossiliferous strata around the earth, all of those things are far better explained by a creation model with the catastrophic worldwide flood, far better explained scientifically than the processes of uniformitarianism and the ascent of man. And now, the last phrase of verse 31, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. What I want to point out here is that the simple, straightforward reading of the words here leads one to believe that God is telling us that he did this work of creation of land animals and man in a literal 24-hour day. And I'll tell you why I believe that. The phrase evening and morning describes a normal day. The day is numbered, the sixth day. In every occurrence in the Old Testament where a day is numbered, the context clearly indicates that it is speaking of a literal 24-hour day. Now, the Hebrew word yom, which is day like yom kippur, the day, the Hebrew word day, it can refer to a 24-hour day and it can refer to an extended period of time. That's legit. It's in the semantic range of the word. So how do you tell which is intended? 
Well, you tell by the context. The context clearly indicates whether this is a time of suffering or a day of suffering. Well, okay, that's a period, that's a time. Or if it's the seventh day, well, that's a specific day. The, the context is very clear about which is intended. The, the, great, the great majority, by the way, in the Hebrew text in the Old Testament, the case is that Yom refers to a 24-hour day, a literal day. Now, fourth, think about this. Adam lived. Adam was created on the sixth day, right? Adam lived through the seventh day, the day of God's rest. He lived through that. He's created on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh day. Adam died at 930 years old. Wow, that's pretty old. That doesn't leave any room for geological ages. The seventh day was 24 hours long. It didn't... Okay, you get my point. Finally, I make this point. This is my fifth and final point. In the creation account, God tells us God tells us. God tells us that he made the universe in what appears to me to be six literal 24-hour days. We should not question his ability to do this. I, I doubt that there's anyone in this room who would question the ability of God to do, what, to do that. Who would say, no, God, you're not able. You're not able. No. We shouldn't question his ability to do this, and I don't think anyone does, nor should we question his veracity when he tells us that that is exactly what he did. It's the testimony of God. We shouldn't question that. So for those, and a few other, and there are others, for those reasons, I conclude that God is referring to a literal 24-hour day. Now, I recognize, I recognize that there are Bible-believing people who have a different view on this. I understand that. And we do not reject them as Christians. You may be one of those people. If you are one of those people, I say to you, that complete agreement on every point of biblical interpretation is not required for membership here at Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you want to dig into that, just check between me and Matt. We don't agree on everything. We agree on some surprisingly significant things, uh, depending on your viewpoint, how significant you think certain things are. But we're in fellowship with one another. So, some may have a different opinion on that, and that uh, complete agreement, you don't have to be like a rubber stamp of us in order to be part of this fellowship and to be in complete good fellowship here at Bethel Bible Fellowship, okay? So don't project that on anybody else around you, all right? Be gracious. The man of God must not be quarrelsome but gentle, kind, persuasive, persuasive. It doesn't mean you don't have a position, but you teach it and you speak it graciously, kindly. Okay, in closing, let me take you to Philosophy 101. In beginning philosophy classes, there are usually are four questions posed. <laughs> Who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose? Where am I going? The evolutionist answers these questions this way. Who am I? Nobody. Where did I come from? A rock. 
What's my purpose? Fertilizer for the future. Where am I going? Nowhere. The biblical creationist answers these questions differently. Who am I? I am an individual made in the image of God. Where did I come from? Psalm 139 tells me that I came directly from the hand of God as I was formed in my mother's womb. What's my purpose? To know God and to represent Him. Where am I going? I'm going home. To be with God for all eternity. Because that's where God lives. God lives in eternity. God inhabits eternity. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask that you would take your word and that you would apply it to our hearts, that you would let it come into our minds, that you would wash our minds, so to speak, uh, with the truth of your word, enable us to uh, comprehend and understand it and then apply it to our lives. You know, Lord, what is needed in each person's life, and I ask you, I invite you, by the power and work of your spirit, to minister from this teaching those truths that are needed for each individual, and those certainly may be different from person to person, and that's, we trust you to do that. We ask you to do that. And we say it in Jesus' name.